Hi everyone. This lecture video is the last in Unit 4 and it will be a little bit shorter. Remember, after we cover the slides together, you should go back into the slides, open the links, read, study. All those connections will improve your memory upon test time. Also answer the discussion board question and be sure to join us for our Zoom meeting this week. So we're going to talk about trace minerals, and I think they're extremely interesting because these are nutrients that we need in only tiny, tiny amounts, specks in some cases, and yet the consequence of not having them in the diet is disastrous, and we'll see that. Bioavailability is important, and we're going to start with iron. So iron is found in every cell of the human body. We talk a lot about iron in hemoglobin and myoglobin. Hemoglobin is the iron-containing component of the blood. And we will also focus on the forms of iron because they're very, very important in terms of their bioavailability. So heme iron, remember hemoglobin, red blood cells. Heme iron is found in animal products and I should say not milk. So often referred to as animal flesh, non-heme from plant products. Heme iron is more efficiently absorbed and non-heme iron, the bioavailability is impacted by other foods eaten at the same time. When we look at iron in the body, you can see here that there's a complex mechanism for absorption, transfer, storage, and you'll find different proteins that take part in all of that. And here we have the hemoglobin and myoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen in the red blood cells, myoglobin in the muscles. Iron deficiency is quite common in premenopausal women. And the reason for that, of course, is the loss of blood. Interestingly, there's very little loss of iron from the body. Most of the loss is from blood loss. So women who menstruate monthly then are at higher risk for iron deficiency. It doesn't happen overnight, and that's what's illustrated here. You see the progression from normal stores, normal iron in the plasma, normal iron in the red blood cells, and then stores are depleted first then the plasma iron, and finally the iron in the red blood cells. So what this means is hemoglobin and hematocrit being low is a late stage indicator of iron deficiency anemia. The process of deficiency has been ongoing for days and weeks. Now when this happens, this iron deficiency anemia, the cells become small and pale. Interestingly, heme is bright, bright red. So when you have adequate heme, the red blood cells are also nice and bright. But without enough heme iron, you have small cells, you have pale cells, and you have red blood cells that are lousy at doing the work of carrying oxygen around. This is a very, very common deficiency. Iron deficiency anemia is microcytic, hypochromic, different than the anemia of uh, B12 and folate, which is a macrocytic anemia. This means small cell, low color. People become very, very tired, but more. We'll look at some of the other symptoms of iron deficiency. And as mentioned, extremely common around the world for a number of reasons. One is, of course, the blood loss that women of childbearing ages experience monthly. Women are also smaller than men, and therefore they tend to consume less food and less iron. So the setup is pretty ripe for iron deficiency. There are also the problems of, of dietary, diets that are imbalanced and low in foods that are high in iron, and that may be due to choice or it may be due to access. And in many parts of the world, there are problems with sanitation, clean water, and intestinal parasites are very common. 
so most common nutrient deficiency in the world. This is one of the slides that I think is especially interesting for nursing and nutrition students. There are many, many symptoms of iron deficiency, and some of them can be picked up on your physical exam when you're talking for the first time to the patient. So many of you, as I'm discussing this and you're listening on your end, probably have had iron deficiency. When I ask in a classroom setting, about a third of the class raises their hand. They often report feeling very, very weak and tired to the point of not wanting to climb out of bed or off of the couch. They get colds and flus more often. They feel cold, especially their fingers and toes, but certainly wrap up in blankets even when it's warm outside. And then interestingly, iron deficiency can cause spoon-shaped nails and certainly because that heme is bright red, pallor or a pale color to the skin or the mucous membranes. And that's what you're looking at in the picture of the eye. Importantly, iron deficiency, and we'll see this with pregnancy, can lead to something called pica, which is an appetite for unusual or non-food substances. So that's another concern. Put all this together for children and you get irritable, restless, hard to control children. So we need to focus on how to get enough iron in the diet, but remembering the importance of bioavailability. Not only do you need to count up, well, you don't need to do this, but if you counted up the milligrams of iron in the food that you eat, you also have to consider what you're eating that food with because it might impair or enhance the absorption. So it's extremely important for people who tend to be iron deficient or who perhaps don't consume heme iron because of things like a vegetarian diet or trying not to consume much meat. I don't consume a whole lot of meat, so I have to be careful about this. I need to make sure that I include the factors that enhance iron absorption. Vitamin C is one of the most important can increase the absorption many times older, I over. I believe your text says six times, six fold. So if I have sliced orange with my stew, my veg vegetarian stew, that will increase the absorption of the non-heme iron in that stew, as would, by the way, any vegetables that contain vitamin C. Also remember that some meat, even a little bit in the same dish, increases the iron absorption. This is something called the meat factor. Now most people don't have to worry about the factors that impair iron absorption, but I will tell you if you tend to be iron deficient, this would be something you want to pay attention to. Many of these foods on the list, as I've mentioned before, are very, very healthy, and I rarely recommend that you cut them out. But there are a couple, let me see here, that we can work with, and I often do. So tea and coffee, even decaffeinated tea and coffee, decrease iron absorption by about 50%. So one of the things you can do is drink your tea and coffee well after or well before your meal. So for me, I would not have tea and coffee with my breakfast. I would tend to eat my breakfast and then a couple of hours later have my tea or coffee. Same could be said of calcium. Calcium decreases the absorption of iron. I need calcium, you need calcium. What we could do if we tend to be iron deficient is to have our high calcium foods with one meal or snack and our high iron foods in another. So I could get my calcium perhaps at lunch. I usually have yogurt at lunch with berries. I could get my calcium perhaps at snacks as well. And then I could focus in on my iron foods during my meals. So kind of separating those things out. Now, the most common concern is iron deficiency, but there is also 
a need to be aware of the toxicity of iron. First of all, iron supplements should kept, be kept well out of the way of children because they can be poisonous. They can be deadly for children. There is a UL set for iron and that's for good reason. There is also a disease called hemochromatosis, that it's a hereditary disease in which people absorb iron almost without limit. So their, their absorption of iron is very high and those individuals do develop chronic diseases early in life. So this led us to understand that storing too much iron could actually be dangerous. And we now know, in fact, that storing too much iron can increase oxidative damage in the body and lead to a number of problems. And these are just a few of them. We're seeing that too much iron can be bad for the brain, increasing the risk of diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and dementia, and also things like type 2 diabetes. So how do we separate these two things out? It gets a little confusing because most women need to focus on getting more iron. They tend to be deficient. And men have the opposite problem. One of the things that women can do is use a cast iron skillet because this adds iron to the meal. But you wouldn't want to cook up the omelet in a cast iron skillet for men. If you take vitamin supplements and you're in a mixed uh, gender household, then you should be sure that women take the supplements intended for women and men those for men. If you look at a one a day for men, there is no iron in that supplement for good reason. It's even true that some doctors recommend that men donate blood occasionally if they don't have any concerns about doing so because it draws down their iron stores. Okay, so we're gonna kind of hop, skip, and jump over these last trace minerals, but they're very important and I'll try to hit upon, you know, what is a, a very, testy, testable question. Okay, one of the things to understand about zinc, often found in some, well, sometimes found in the same foods as iron. So you'll see a little bit of overlap there. It also is affected by other foods consumed at the same meal because of things like phytates. Just um, kind of a current news type thing. Zinc seems to have some antiviral properties. However, it is not a preventive uh, therapy for viruses. So there are some studies that have shown with some other viruses that zinc lozenges, things like coldies may help. In fact, they seem to lessen the duration of a cold, but it certainly is not preventive or a cure. Interestingly, also, if you take too much zinc, in, even in the form of lozenges, it can be toxic. But the first thing you typically notice is a metallic taste in your mouth if you're overdoing it. Read about copper. Copper and zinc have an interesting relationship. This is one of the reasons that dietitians are not overly happy when people start taking single nutrient supplements because in overdoing one, you can decrease another. Okay, I'll let you read over these. Some of these minerals act as antioxidants. Okay, this being another of them. As far as selenium, look up Kishan disease. It's quite interesting as well. It affects the heart muscle. And I'm going to stop for a minute and talk a little bit of, about iodine because iodine's pretty interesting. Iodine's interesting because of how significant the physical effects of the deficiency are. We have had plenty of iodine in our diet because of iodized salt. What's happening now, however, is that with most of our salt coming from processed foods instead of the salt shaker, 
There may be a little bit more concern about this. We haven't seen iodine deficiencies as far as I've known in this country, but when you look into the salt use and processing, they don't use iodized salt. So there is a need of iod for iodine for sure. Its most important function seems to be as part of thyroid hormones and the consequences of deficiency are quite drastic. So here you see what occurs in pregnancy and early life, a cretinism. Notice also that they talk about foods that are goitrogens, okay, including cabbage and millet, which limits the bioavailability of iodine. If you have some coleslaw or enjoy cabbage, you don't have to be worried about developing a goiter, which we'll look at next. This tends to occur in diets or in, that are imbalanced and loads of the, these foods are consumed so that the goitrogens become more of a concern. So this is a goiter and remember that for the test, when you don't have enough iodine to produce these thyroid hormones, what happens is that the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, keeps pounding away at the thyroid, which enlarges. So the goiter is a sign of an iodine deficiency, a severe iodine deficiency. What I'd say about chromium, and we're still talking about trace minerals here, is that it seems to be involved in carbohydrate and lipid metabolism and to have a connection to glucose intolerance. So that's an area where there's some study going on. Do chromium supplements perhaps decrease the risk of developing diabetes? The last time I checked, which was fairly recently, there wasn't a clear answer on that, but that's something to watch. Fluoride, of course, is added to the water supply in a lot of municipalities and what it has done is harden our teeth so it they don't develop cavities. There are also foods that are naturally high in fluoride. Notice this interaction between calcium rich foods and fluoride as well. So fluoride has done a good job at decreasing caries or cavities in the population, but if you get too much of it, it can cause, cause hyperfluorosis or a modeling of your teeth. So you see that there. They're very hard teeth and wouldn't form cavities, but pe people, of course, don't want to go overboard for this reason. So often students will ask me, well, I, I give my baby baby water and I know that has fluoride in it or I don't use the tap water for my baby. I would always refer those questions to your pediatrician. You do want to make sure that you're giving the right amount of fluoride but not too much to young children. So very, very lastly, we need to talk about dietary supplements. And this is important. We've covered a lot of ground here. We've looked at these vitamins and minerals, what they do, what they don't do, what occurs when you get too little, what occurs when you get too much. There are many different types of dietary supplements. They are not all vitamins and minerals. We also have herbals, and we also have things like sports nutrition supplements. These supplements come under a different piece of legislation that regulates them, which barely regulates them, and that's the problem. So this is the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, and because of this act, they are not regulated as prescription and over-the-counter medications are. So that's important to keep in mind. There is a label on your supplement, but there is no guarantee that what's on the label is in the supplement. What ends up having to occur is that you need to be very wise, very smart, and do research before you take supplements. 
for your tests, I would definitely say read over all of this. They do not require FDA review before they're marketed. And if people start getting sick from the supplements, the FDA must prove absolutely that the supplement caused the problem. So there's a bit of a lag time between ill effects of the supplement and the supplement being removed from the market. Safety data is required for ingredients that are relatively new, so new since 1994. So that is required by the FDA. But if the ingredients in a supplement were around in the 80s or the 70s, no safety data is required. So where does that leave the consumer and where does that leave the healthcare provider who's trying to give advice? We do have a couple of, of resources. Um, one is this USP, the FD, oh, let me top down here. The US Pharmacopoeia has developed a vi voluntary dietary supplement verification program. If you look at nature-made supplements, they have this seal on a lot of their supplements, and that means that it complies with these good practices. What I use is consumerlab.com, and I'd ask you to explore consumerlab.com the best as you're able. It is a subscription service, not overly expensive, but you can get onto the main page and can't call up a report. If you ever need a report on a supplement, just let me know and I'll generate that for you. ConsumerLab.com is an independent testing agency for supplements and they have a wealth of information. They review the research, the problems, the promises in a very unbiased way. So I do take some supplements for a number of reasons, but before I do, I carefully research not only the supplement or the, the product itself, but also the manufacturer, because some manufacturers don't do a good job and others do. This leaves a lot of the burden for us. Therefore, there are cautions and considerations. With regards to herbals, many consumers think that since they're from plants, they're safe. But remember, plants contain bioactive substances and were the root ingredient in many early medications. So herbal supplements can have side effects. They can have contraindications. They can interact with other medications. Do not assume that they're safe. You really need to do your research with regards to these products. The other thing I would mention has to do with this who needs supplementation is more about vitamins and minerals. It is very easy for us to say, get everything you need from food, you know, eat a well-balanced diet. But there are so many things that get in the way of people doing that. So I do think it's a little short-sighted when dietitians say, oh, nobody needs supplements. You can get everything you need from a diet. This is from your textbook, and it's a list of individuals who may need a supplement. And you can clearly see here that there are many people on this list. It includes people not consuming many calories because it's difficult to get the vitamins and minerals you need from that low calorie diet. It includes vegans, and we talked about that. We talked about vitamin B12. We talked about calcium and vitamin D. Infants and children young women and pregnant women, older adults, individuals with darker skin, individuals with restricted diet, people taking medications, cigarette smokers, and alcohol users. Please read over this chart carefully because I think we do need to go beyond the kind of blanket statement, oh, just eat food. Some of you, when you complete your unit four work and make the changes to your diet, will hit almost all of your vitamin and mineral needs. And you would fall then into that statement. You probably do not need a supplement. And some of you, when you do this in a realistic way, will not be able to. One of the vitamins that I think many people need to consider is vitamin D. It's very hard to get from the diet, and many of us don't get the sunlight that we need. 
or wear clothing <laughs> that prevents us from making vitamin D or have darker skin tones, which also drops the vitamin D production. So think carefully and critically about this. On Wednesday, when we meet, we will do the Kahoot review and answer your questions. And that is all for today. Take care of yourselves and stay safe and healthy.